before you got here, Nicole, that it looks like we found a renter. So that's cool. Um, so we've been talking about a few different things. And I want to kind of bring up last week before we get going into this week. Um, before we talk about the witnessing part, I talked about pornography, and I talked about, you remember the layers of sin? You remember that? And there was, like, anger, then there was, like, pornography, and there was, like, lust, and then there was right. not submitting to God, okay? Right. And why I wanted to bring that up is because when I got out of porn, I realized my problem wasn't porn. My, the... The problem that I had wasn't porn. I was looking at porn, but the problem I had was much deeper than porn. See what I mean? It went something like this. During my childhood, some things happened. I really want to get into it. And, and I, it made me feel very insecure. And it made me feel very uh, unloved. And um, it made me feel kind of like my world was way more fragile than I wanted to believe. And... Without getting too much into it, I kind of started to feel very sad. Not really depression, as adults would know it, but, but very, very sad outlook at, at, at the world. And I didn't really know how to deal with this. Uh, and so to seek safety, I, 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 I found comfort in pornography. I, it was, it was the, the lust gave me security. See what I mean? That was my problem. I didn't learn to trust God in a, shaky, in a shaky situation. Because of it, I developed other problems. See, I struggled with pornography for so long, I thought that was my problem, but that, that wasn't my problem. My problem was I needed to realize that there were things going on in my life beyond my control that I could only find peace with in realizing that they were beyond my control, but in realizing that God was still in control. See what I mean? And when you realize that, you're able to submit your life to God, and then you're able to get your pornography or your anger or whatever it is under control. See what I mean? Because we like to look at the top of the thing and say, oh, if I just deal with this, I'll be good. Right. But there's a much deeper problem. And you, you know, we brought this up with the whole drug thing. If you get out of drugs and you don't deal with the problem that got you into drugs, you'll just find something else to replace it. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't do drugs anymore. Yeah, but you overwork. Your family needs you, and you're just as detached off of drugs as you were on drugs because the problem hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. You've just replaced it. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And uh, so then the addictive behavior, it never ends. It just repeats itself. It just manifests in a new way. So what I mean? So the pornography wasn't, wasn't the issue. No. Because you can get over pornography and compensate by food. Yeah, food or... <laughs> See what I mean? You can compensate in a lot of different ways, and you're not actually resolving the issue that there is. Mm -hmm. You're replacing the issue that there is. See what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So often, but sometimes we get kind of... Overfocused on the problem. And I'm not saying pornography isn't a, isn't a problem. Pornography is a bad thing, but right. you need to really. Who's seen Hunger Games? There's a part where where um the the pitchfork throwing guy. What's his name? Uh, Peter? No, no. Well, the pitchfork. The pitchfork. Uh, the 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 oh, trident. Uh, the trident. Uh, uh, from he's Finnick. from yes, yes Finnick. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's a part where Finnick turns to um. Oh, crap, dang it. I'm forgetting everybody's name. Where Finnick turns to Katniss and he says, remember who the real enemy is. Uh -huh. And that's exactly the thing. Remember who the real enemy is. It looks like, oh, this is the enemy. No, it's actually not. It's not the enemy. No. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, uh, it's a disgusting version of something that God created, but it's not the enemy in and of itself. It's something else that you need to focus on. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm not, once again, you do need to deal with the problems that, like overeating and pornography and those kinds of things. But... Anyways, you get what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. So then also we talked about witnessing, and I wanted to throw a, throw a situation at you. I, I knew this guy from college, okay? And I'll just read it as I wrote it. A guy I knew went to Asia on a missions trip. Uh, while he was there, he got tired of having to do such cautious witnessing, you know, where you can't directly say the name of Jesus. You have to, you know, it's this long, drawn-out process. He got tired of it, and he went to directly witness to the people and said, but... I think this lasted like a day or two, and then he was kicked out of the out of the country. Mm -hmm. And um, he wasn't going just by himself; he was going under the name of a certain missionary organization. So, uh, so I mean, uh, he ruined it for and for his future. Right. And now it was more rocky for other people. See what I mean? Right. And caused all these problems. But I don't want to try to. I don't want you to kind of hop to conclusions. I want you to seriously think to think about this. Okay. 
Was he abno- was he doing obnoxious witnessing? The American version would be going door to door. Or was he being impatient? Or was he doing something out of a clear conscience? Or was he just rushing something that could have happened naturally if he would have waited? Think about this, okay? Think about it. Because it's easy to say, oh, he was wrong, but at the same time, <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah. If you're a missionary, you're not wanting to really twiddle your thumbs. You're, you're kind of wanting to do something, or else you wouldn't be a missionary. Right. See what I mean? <laughs> uh, and then you, well, what about Paul? Well, that's true. Paul never never did that. Paul went straight to saying Jesus, and he was either beaten or, or <laughs> thrown out of the city, or <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, well, that's a good point. <laughs> Paul never did do that. Uh-uh. Did Jesus ever do it? No, no, Jesus never did that either. No. So we're kind of stuck with a little bit of a predicament. We don't have any biblical examples right. of the slow, precarious witnessing. Right. But at the same time, yeah. I know a lot of missionaries who have been able to make headway through that process, yeah, right. even though it's not necessarily in the Bible. Uh-huh. What do you guys think? You look like your words are on your mouth. No? Yes and no. <laughs> Do you want to share anything? Not at the moment. I'm still okay. trying to figure out what I'm trying to say. Zach, you also look like you were about to say something. Are you still mulling it over? In a way that I think he's kind of little of both impatient and rushed. Mm-hmm. So you think he should have waited? He, at least... Waited for it, or be a little more calmer uh, up as an approach. Hmm. Okay. You know. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. Uh, I'm trying not to sway your opinion on this. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> it just seems like he was just, okay, this ain't going to work. I'm going to do it a mm-hmm. different way. And then a result, yeah. You got. You know, kick it up. Yeah. Gracie, Nicole? What I'm kind of thinking is, yes, he was, it seems like he was slightly impatient. Uh uh-huh. Because from how I see it, it should happen, with, especially with witnessing, that it should happen in its own time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. That it should just, it should happen exactly when it's meant to. Mm-hmm. In order for it to do any real good. Hmm. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I think he was right of doing it that way. Yeah, just kind of it's hard, isn't it? Is, yeah. It's a lot harder to say this is the rule than to say, well, what about this huge but, gray area? <laughs> it, but he's gonna, he has to think about in God's timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also has to think about, um, could he have brought more to Christ if he would have been more patient with it? Mm. Right. He may have, he may have gotten, you know, a couple to Christ. The way he rushed it, but I mean, could have mm-hmm. gotten, you know, even more like a, a, if it would have stayed there longer, yeah. you know. Yeah, and also something to think about is the people who were saved, would they have been uh, guilty by association where the government would have just held them in, anyways? Right. And then with him being rushy with it, he he could prevent, you know, other people from, from yes. coming in and getting other people. Another thing I, I was thinking about was. Paul never faced a situation like this before. No. See, what we have is a government who's aware of Christianity right. and has taken ex- specific steps to, to get rid of religion in total. Right. Paul never dealt with that. No. Rather, in Rome, there was a plethora of religions. Right. That, that, no. See what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And uh, whereas they didn't like him saying that this was the only option, Jesus was the only way, Right. That he was the Messiah. They obviously they didn't like these things, but still there was no. See what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and in fact, Rome really didn't get involved. In, I mean, they got involved in the sense of, of keeping up law for the Jews because they right. saw it as a Jewish Jews. issue. So Jews were breaking the law and whatever. It, it is. Yeah. Right. But the Rome didn't really take interest Me into too. stopping Christianity no. uh-huh. until the hundreds AD. You right. know, we're talking about seventy years after the fact of Jesus. Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, and and then we see we see a Rome that that is very anti, 
anti anti church, you know, and we see that climaxing all the way into the through the two hundreds, into the th into the three hundreds AD, um, when uh, Emperor Constantine. Um, but with that being said, uh, it's something to think about. Yeah. Because when uh, when the persecution was going on, they still had Christians going out and uh, and, and facing that. But they were all part of one empire. Right. It was all Rome. It's not like this is all China. Right. We are America going into China, so it's this, it's, it's, it's still different. It's, yeah. And it's and there it's a hard it's a hard hard thing, and I, I just wanted to go back to that because last week I said it in a very clear and, and clear and, and cut and paste kind of moving along kind of thing. Right. I wanted to show you guys that it's not always that cl that clear and concise. No. Okay, I wanted you to understand what the Bible said. I wanted you to understand how we have to be intentional with our witnessing. But by all means, it is not simple. Oh. So, Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to start start the actual uh, discussion for the night. And I want to start start with your sexuality, specifically your sexuality. Because we've talked about in a lot of ways um, <coughs> how you need to discover yourself. You know, um, you can't ignore the fact that you're a sexual person. And sex, being a sexual person goes beyond having sex, goes into having relationships and, and having meaningful conversations, having, you know, something to pour into somebody else and other people pouring into you. We are sexual people. Uh, but, and we talked about, you know, um, how sometimes we have same-sex attractions, which is, you know, something that happens to, happens to people and that sometimes people uh, grow out of this and sometimes they don't. Uh, but then we talked about the way that with transsexual, that's not actually a sexual orientation. It's a sexual confusion. It's a mental confusion. Okay? Because you're believing something that's not true. I believe I am a man trapped in a woman's body. Well, why? Because you do hobbies that are considered not good for your, for your gender? That's not a good enough reason. Well, because I'm attracted to the opposite sex. So you've got homosexual tendencies. I mean, this is this is easy. Um, or no, I just I just feel uh, I just feel pretty and witty and gay. <laughs> you guys seen that movie? You know? uh, anger management. Anyways, not important. And moving on. Uh, and uh, the the truth is that that that's that's called a mental mental disorder. You know what I mean? If you believe something that's not true, it doesn't matter how hard you believe it. It's not true. You know what I mean? I believe I'm a bird. Well, I'm not a bird, though. I'm a person. Seriously, you see what I mean? That if you believe something was not, that just means you're disillusioned. You know what I mean, I believe that the Earth is the center of the center of the center of the solar, solar system. It's not. It's not though. The sun is, and the Earth goes around the sun. So I mean, it's just, these are these are facts. <laughs> see what I mean? Like, <laughs> you don't have to believing something doesn't make it true or not true. But just because you believe something doesn't mean that you see what I'm saying. Exactly. Um, so, but now I want to look a little bit different on sec your, your sexuality. First off, if you do not accept yourself now, you won't then. Oftentimes, people say this: If I could just do this, I would be pretty. If I could just change this, I would be a handsome person. If I could just do this, people would like me. The truth is, if you cannot accept who you are and how you are now, nothing is going to change that. You can change different factors to, uh, to, to, to your life. You can, you can try to lose weight. You can put on makeup. You can try and get plastic surgery. But at the end of the day, you will have done those things out of, out of in, um, self-consciousness. Yeah. And all of that will do is amplify your problem with yourself. Because what happens is we try, we try to find peace in our minds when there's not peace in our spirit. See what I mean? You have to be at peace with yourself in order to be at peace with others. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you, you can't be at war with yourself, always thinking, you know, uh, I'm no good, I, I'm ugly, I'm, I'm fat, I'm this, I'm that, and the other thing, and then still actually be able to have a healthy relationship with other people. Because there's a war inside of you that will always go to other people. If you're critical of yourself, you will be critical of others, I eventually, maybe, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not denying that sometimes it takes a while, you know, maybe it'll take some time, but... It'll happen nevertheless. Um, you know, and, and, and if you're overly critical of other people, eventually you're going to be overly critical of yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you can't live in troubled waters and think that you're going to have smooth sailing. It's just not going to happen. Right. So, um, so you have to accept yourself as you are. Who you are, what you are. Second, 
better um, better what you can change and accept what you can't. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, well, I feel like I'm just a fat. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, fine. You want to work out? Fine. Go ahead and work out. If you think there's something about you that you can better, go ahead. As long, now, within reason. For instance, oh, I could, I'd be prettier if I just got this uh, lip surgery or breast surgery or you know what? Pick the list of different things that people have augmented on their body. But that doesn't mean that you should. <laughs> just because you can doesn't mean you should. And uh, and so I'm more talking about better the things you can change. Like uh, you have poor hygiene. Okay, so take showers every day. I don't. You know, those things like that. I'm not talking about go and get plastic surgery. That is not the things I'm talking about. Um, so better what you can change, but accept what you can't. This is who I am. This is how I look. You know, if you have character flaws that are that are looming, change them. That's fine. Change your always always adapt. Always better yourself. That's a great thing. But there are certain aspects of you that will forever be you, and that's okay. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, I'm just too I'm just too too trusting of a person. I need to stop being so naive. No, that's 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 who you are. Right. You know what I mean? Don't change stuff like that. People need more nice people in the world. For goodness sakes, people need more nice people in the world. Um, people making fun of us only matters if it matters to us. Let me let me throw a hypothetical situation at you. Now, we were all in high school at one time. and High school is rough, guys. <laughs> it's rough. It's just a bad idea. Even the idea of, of high school is a bad one. Let's take a bunch of people who are discovering their hormones and are already insecure, and let's throw them into the same arena. It'll be like a gladiator fight. <laughs> it's just a bad idea. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. Um, remember back to how awkward you felt back then anyways. And then let's say somebody starts making fun of you. Now, one of the things I was made fun of for was being fat. I know. I got really skinny, and everybody couldn't imagine I was fat. Now I'm fat again, and everybody's like, oh, what happened there? It happens, guys. It happens. So anyways, um, one of the things I was always made fun, made fun of was for being fat. And, and think about that as a, as a, uh, as a um, something to be made fun of. You're fat. Okay. So I mean, like, why does that matter to us? It doesn't change your value as a person at all. Right. See what I mean? But it matters to us because we're insecure about that. Mm -hmm. So now the insult matters. Uh -huh. See what I mean? You see what I'm getting at, right? right? It only matters if it matters to us. Right. You've got brown hair. Well, if she is insulted by brown hair, suddenly it matters to her. But if she doesn't care that she has brown hair, then who cares? Right. So that means you're fat. Well, okay, does it matter to you? If it matters to you, then it matters. You see what, I, you see what I'm getting at here? Yeah. Yeah. People, people making fun of us only matters if it matters to us. So what we have to do is we have to accept the... Uh, I swear nobody was farting there was a phone. <laughs> um, so then what we have to do is we have to realize who we are and we have to accept that. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, and, uh, I, I've known some people who genuinely couldn't lose weight because I don't really understand how it works, but you know, thyroid issues and stuff like that, that you know what I mean? Right. And there's nothing wrong with being overweight. Um, what's wrong is with not taking care of stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Like. I'm not taking care of my body. I'm eating whatever I want, whenever I want. I overeat all the time. I eat a bunch of junk food like McDonald's all day. That's poor stewardship of your body. Extreme. Right. I mean, like, that's just a bad idea. It's a bad idea to eat McDonald's once a month, let alone all the time. Right. I mean, come on. <laughs> but with that being said, so I would say, you know, we need to do things like be good managers of our body. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? That, that's something we should do. Um, we should watch what we eat. We should watch what we drink. We should watch how you know. Make sure we get good enough sleep for our bodies. We should take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying saying that at all. But it shouldn't be such a such. It shouldn't be your driving force in life just because you're insecure. All right. See what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, and this is part of your sexuality, you guys. This is part of your sexuality. Right. Okay. When we have inner conflict, it spreads to others, and how we treat others, which spreads from enemies to friends. It doesn't matter. You know, what people try to do is they say this. I treat them ugly because I don't like them. But then, eventually, that same attitude will go to the people you do like. Mm -hmm. Because you've allowed a bad attitude in your heart. And bad attitudes don't know when to stop. Right. Bad attitudes always spread. Just like we were talking about sin, remember? And I said, sin always spreads. Always. 
So you can't say, I'm going to be bitter towards this person because they're my enemy and I'm just going to stop there. No. If you allow bitterness in your life, it's going to spread. And eventually it'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. And you will stop liking you as much. And then the thing is you'll actually fool yourself into thinking that you like yourself a lot. Right. Oh, they're just self-absorbed. No, they have no, no respect for themselves. They sleep around with whoever they feel like. They do whatever they, they feel like. They don't take care of themselves. They have no respect for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, hopefully that kind of brings some ideas there. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes when we realize that, this, that there's a problem with us, with our sexuality and stuff, rather than maturing past it, and, and there's a very healthy process here, guys. When we say this is who we are and I can't change that, See, I mean, there's a certain healthiness that comes through that, and we're able to mature through it, okay? But sometimes, rather than maturing, we try to do the opposite. We try to just either stay the same or just backpedal, okay? So seeking joy through things instead of God. If I just work harder, I'll be happier. If I exercise more, I'll be happier. If I do, see, what I mean, if I distract myself with video games or movies, if I if I do this hobby that I've always wanted to do, then I'll be happy. And we distract ourselves and actually think. That seeking joy through all these things is going to make, bring it, make us happy. And sometimes we actually do things that, that we say, oh, I'm seeking after God. Oh, well, I'm serving as the, as the worship pastor at church. I'm serving as the kids, uh, kids leader at church. I'm doing this. See what I mean? and, we, and we fool ourselves into thinking that we're doing it for God. But the truth is we're doing it for ourselves so that we find purpose in our lives. Right. Because we haven't come to grips with who we are. And so instead of trying to mature past it, we instead get bored. And transfer that and try to try to distract ourselves through our lives. And so we go from thing to thing to thing, and we never find a purpose in life because we don't understand that our purpose isn't found out there. Our purpose in life is found in here. That makes sense? We'll talk more about that later, but uh, basically, things will never will never bring you purpose. Seeking after God will, will bring you purpose. So, anyways... Um, so, so we do that through a, a, a plethora of different things. First off, we try good things. I mean, good things are good, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if I if I seek distraction by these good things, surely that's okay. An example of this would be vacation. Ah, oh, we'll just go on vacation. Well, I'm tired again. Let's go on another vacation. Mm -hmm. So we do all these good things, and, and it's not like they're, they're they're bad things. They're good things. Vacations right. are good things. We all need right. vacations. Um, I'll just spend a weekend with my family. I'll I'll just. Uh, I'll just uh, buy myself a game system. These are these are things that aren't aren't that bad. But then there's neutral things, things that aren't necessarily good and aren't really aren't that bad either. Like I mentioned, video games already. Um, you know, getting Netflix and stuff like these. These aren't these aren't really good things and aren't really bad things. They're just things. They're neutral. Or sometimes we go to the bad things to distract us: pornography, or uh, see what I mean? These different things that are genuinely bad things. And um, all that we're doing really is lying to ourselves and keeping ourselves from growing and maturing. Um, and then there's a, then there's a fourth option. It's not good, neutral, or bad. It's just ignoring the problem. You see people do this when they overindulge in work. They All that they ever live and think about is work. Work, 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 work. Or they do the other opposite and try to ignore it by doing nothing. I'm just going to float through my life, and let's hope that that works. You know what I mean? Right. The, ignoring the problem. One's extreme work. Right, yeah. right. And so this is just an example of all these, di all these different things that we try as an alternative to maturity. Good things, like vacation. Bad things, like pornography. Neutral things, like, uh, like video games. And, or just simply ignoring it. It may temporarily distract you, but it won't satisfy. See, the problem is in our culture... There is no there's really no distinction being made between being distracted and being content. Being distracted is where you don't you're not paying attention to the problem. You don't realize that there's a problem, okay? Being content is where you know where you are, you know who you are, and you know what you are, and you've accepted it. There's a difference. Okay, content realizes the problem. It realizes the solution. Paul talks about this in Philippians. I have learned the secret in having a lot of things and having nothing, in being rich and being poor, in all these different circumstances of life, I have learned the secret. I have learned to be content. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. 
He'll give me the strength if I'm rich to do the right thing. He'll give me the strength when I'm poor to do the right thing. And as I seek after him, he'll provide for my needs. I'm okay. I've learned to be content with Christ. Content. See what I mean? But then what people try to do is they try to substitute being content with being satisfied. See what I mean? So they do this thing right here where, where they try to satisfy themselves by distracting themselves. Okay? And all that they do, it's time for me to move on from this job. Why? Is, is God calling you to do something? Mm. Oh, no. Nothing in my life is changing. I just want to get a different job. Okay. So then five years down the road, they're at a different job. So, I mean, they're, they're not really committing to anything in life because they're always looking for something to distract them. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It doesn't actually resolve the issue. So be content with where and what you are, but always strive to better yourself. I know it sounds like a little bit of a hypocrisy, but it's true. Be content with, with, with where you are and what you are, but always strive to better yourself. Uh, what, what I, knew, I, knew that, I knew a professor, his name was Dr. Doherty, and his name, he, he always used to say this. Always change. Always change. You shouldn't wake up days in, 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 every day and be the same person. You should always be changing. You should always be, be adapting, be learning. So, I mean, be a different person. Always strive to better yourself. That's a good thing. But also realize who you are and accept that. See what I mean? Sounds like a, as, as you as you struggle with the situation, you'll find balance between the two extremes. Um, but uh, so then, because of a lack of, of understanding with our sexuality, we have comments like this made. Why do people think it's okay to call babies he or she? They can't speak yet, so they can't say their preferred gender. Please refer to them as baby self or toddler self until they can say their pronoun preference, otherwise you're ableist and transphobic. Do you see the confusion yeah. in this? Completely obli oblivious to how the world actually works. So, I mean, like, uh, this is just, it's unscientific. I mean, it, it's stupid. It's unreasonable. Right. I mean, it, it, I don't know. It's just... Uh, uh, I, I thought of a, I thought of a nice little analogy that, that would help you guys understand this. First, when you aren't on drugs, you can see somebody with a drug mindset. Mm -hmm. They're always starting things. They're never finishing it. Right. They're always wanting things, but they don't really know how to do it. They're always just, just uh, talking about how, oh, man, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, but then they never actually do it. Right. I mean, they're, they're always uh, – they're, they're just real immature in their thinking. You know what I mean? Like uh, – like at 14, they just took their brain out of the head, went and did all the stupid stuff, and now here they are at 50, and they put the brain back in, but it's still the 14-year-old brain. See yeah. what I mean? And so they're walking around, and, and it, it, it's, they don't see it. Mm -hmm. Even when they're off of drugs, they don't see it. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Because they were on drugs. Right. Why can't she see how stupid this, this comment is? See what I mean? Because that's where she is, up here. Mm -hmm. There's a confusion in our society about our sexuality. People don't know what the heck's going on. Mm -hmm. So then a confused society raises confused children. And then what do you think happens? They turn into adults. And because they have sex with whoever they want, whenever they want, they're going to have – eventually they're going to have kids if they don't abort them all. They're going to have kids that they're going to teach their same values to of confusion. Mm -hmm. So you have inbred families who are just confused. Right. I was watching this thing the other day. It's kind of disgusting. All these different people um, were all upset because it's our sexuality, so we should be able to choose whether we get in a relationship with our siblings, with our parents, with our children. I was like, what the crap oh, are you guys even that? talking about? So, I mean, things that aren't even reasonable anymore. People literally justifying having multiple wives. People literally justifying having sex with animals. Because they're confused, and the yeah. church is being silent because we don't talk about sex in the church. See what I mean? And yeah. so the confused society has nowhere to turn to. Uh -huh. Well, what do you think's going to happen? Yeah. We as a church, we are the church. The, 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 we are the church, and eventually, those older people who don't even want to want to spell the spell the letters consecutively that, that spell out sex, we're eventually going to be in their place. Mm -hmm. We have an important opportunity to play in, in this world that the church is relevant, that we can answer questions, that we can serve the community, mm -hmm. that there are answers besides the mass confusion that, that, that's at play in, in, in the media. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And the thing is, I bet, I bet people actually thought that this made sense, but let's take it apart. Why do people think it's okay to call babies he or she? Well, um. first off, because it's, a, it's not... It's not a mental issue. 
It's a physical issue. It's a scientific issue. I, I keep arguing with people. It's like the whole thing about abortion. Oh, the only reason why you don't think abortion is right is because of, of your Bible, which is outdated. And, and they t turn it into a whole thing about arguing against the Bible. I don't even use the Bible in my argu argument against abortion. This is what I say. Science shows it's a human being. Yeah. Scientifically, you are killing a human being. There, I don't need my Bible. That's a scientific fact. Mm -hmm. what, are you gonna say I something? seen something about that the other day on Facebook that says, why don't we declare somebody living when their heart stops, but we can declare them dead when their heart... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, but don't declare the yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's a heartbeat, it's obviously a lot. Well, just a massive cells. It's like, where do you get that? We have actually analyzed scientifically those massive cells, and we found that that it is a human being with its own DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay, we when it develops, what do you think it turn it, it, it turns into an adult, right? Yeah. Well, evidently, these people who condone abortion think that it, it turns into. Yeah. Maybe thing. maybe a dinosaur. Who knows? <laughs> it's not a human yet. Well, okay, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. And I suppose that a chicken and egg isn't really a chick. What do you think's in that egg? And so, you know what I mean? Mass confusion because there there nobody uh, knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. Uh, they can't speak, so they can't say they prefer gender. It doesn't matter what you prefer in life. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to have enough money to be able to pay off all my loans, but I can't. Why? Because life isn't about fair. Life isn't fair. Oh. Life isn't about our preference. Life happens. It's happening all around us. Consider this, that right now there's a, there was a baby born that has cancer. Mm -hmm. Will not live to see its first, first birthday. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make yeah. sense. Crazy things happen in life. Right. I mean, honestly, just go driving. You honestly think that those crazy people and people drivers that are out there, <laughs> that they know what the heck's going on? <laughs> I mean, come on! Yeah. Please refer to them as baby self or toddler self until they can say their pronoun preference. Otherwise, you're... Okay, A, it's a well-known fact that a person's ability to reason is not actually um, matured until they're about 23, 25. All right. So that would mean technically that would be wrong anyways because you'd have to wait till they're about 23, 25 for their reason to settle in for them to actually decide who they were. Mm -hmm. With that being said, we don't decide what we are. We are born what we are. So that just really makes sense. Also, transphobic is where you have a fear from the Greek phob, uh, um, phoebus, mm -hmm. fear of something. Transphobic would be a fear of transsexuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, It is not transphobic to say that a, a baby born as a boy is a boy. That's not transphobic. That's stating a scientific fact. Right. This is unscientific and it's unreasonable. But the thing is, people actually believe crap like this because they don't know. Our sexuality is undefined. And honestly, the church is doing a very poor job in defining it. So, oh, let me go back and see if there's any other notes I wanted to say. Um, she doesn't understand why she's wrong. I already mentioned that. As, and so this is what I wanted to say in all that. As the Holy Spirit changes us, we start seeing things we were blind to before. But what we try to do as Christians, we get upset with stupidity. Let's yeah, be honest. Right. And so we start taking it out against the person. That doesn't make sense. It's <laughs> no. stupid. And so we start making fun of them. Not okay. No. And then we start um, trying to argue their points that they'll be saved. And everything will be okay because they'll think better. When the truth is that the Holy Spirit shows us things in, our, in ourselves that, that we're blind to. Right. She doesn't even realize why she's wrong. Okay? She Drug yeah. addicts don't even understand... Mm -hmm. That they have a drug mentality. They don't. They don't get that. No. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit changes us and opens our minds to things that we're blind to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is a process. Um. So let's talk very briefly about dating. You two are single, so I think this will be a benefit to you, Gracie. If I ever die, you might want to watch, write this down. First off, <laughs> don't date others if you are already dating someone. There is one exception to this rule. Casual dating, in which case at the start, it is clearly said between the two of you, this is not serious, I am seeing other people, I'm just kind of uh, wanting to hang out with people. Right. Nothing serious, just like a friend-on-friend -friend basis, in which case it's not really dating, right. it's just hanging out. Right. Hey, I want to just hang out, I'm lonely, I just want to spend some time out, I do not want a relationship, I just want to go to the movies and I don't want to go alone. Right. I, I know a guy who signs up to a dating site 
because he moves around a lot, and so he doesn't have a chance to really get a good relationship. But he cl says clearly on his profile, not looking for a, for a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend or anything like that. I just want somebody to go to the movies with so that I can have a fun time with because, you know, hey, I just want to go spend some time outside of my house because I'm always alone. Right. So very clearly, very plain out there. I would say that's the only exception to this rule. Once you're going for even a second date and, and, and you think there's even a possibility that it might escalate, it needs to be the only person you're dating. Right. Because what's going to happen is you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt them. So just let's cover that. Um, <clears throat> when you date, you should realize the, the seriousness of dating. Okay, you are you're trying to find someone to spend your life with, which is why I don't agree with blind dating. Right. Because you know nothing about this person and you feel lonely, so you're trying to overcompensate with someone you know nothing about. Uh -huh. See what I mean? Right. Dating should be done with prayer. It should be done very patiently. Yeah. And it should be done with people who you only only date somebody who you think is going to be good marriage material. Right. Don't don't waste your time or their time on somebody that's not even going to be serious. I already told you guys a story um, about the woman who was dating this guy for three years, and he kept trying to propose, and, and he even planned this thing out to Disney World to, to propose to her there, and, and she knew, and she said, wait, why am I postponing this? We've been dating for three years. I don't want it to go further, and we're just kind of existing in this relationship. So she said, okay, let's just break up. Saved the guy a lot of time and saved him his trip to, to Disney World. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, geez, why milk something that's not serious? And it's about integrity. When you date, be a person with integrity. Be the same person behind closed doors that you are in front of, in front of them. You know what I mean? They shouldn't think that you're really invested in them. And then turns out you're pretending to seven other people too. So, I mean, have integrity in what you do. Um, don't use your loneliness in life as an excuse to mistreat people. That's just, that's just not cool. Um, so don't date what you wouldn't marry. I already kind of mentioned this. Don't get yourself in a pickle. When, when you start dating somebody out of obligation, you start staying in the relationship because, ah, why not? They're as good as anyone else. See what I mean? You're doing them a disservice because they actually assume that you're into them. See what I mean? Don't, don't, don't do this. Uh, it, it's not healthy for you. And it's not healthy for them. Always, always, always have the question of would I marry this? And you can't possibly know if you would marry someone unless you know that person. Which is why I highly encourage not blind dating. <laughs> so anyways, you'll just get yourself in a pickle. Don't date if you are married or separated. Uh, people get confused on this. If you are married, you have an obligation before God, the person, and yourself to stay with that person. Okay? Now, so what happens a lot today is become a little more common. It's something called separation. Basically, you're still legally married, but you're not really living together. And you're not really li doing life together. Yeah. And people use this as an excuse to date around. But here's the thing, though, guys. Before God, you are still married. Uh -huh. So when you're dating, you're actually breaking your wedding vows, and you're making the person you're dating, you're making them an adulterer, uh -huh. which means you're causing them to sin. Obviously, you're causing yourself to sin, too. But you're causing the other person to sin. Right. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this is something that, that it's an immoral thing. We shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. Single people should date single people. It's, it's, it's like that. Right. If you are in a relationship and you think that it's going nowhere and you want to break it off, don't start dating someone else until you have broken it off. Integrity, guys. Integrity. A lot of this stuff was common sense 30 years ago. It's not common <laughs> sense nowadays. People date around and they just kind of, ah, to hell with them. You know what I mean? Like There's no common courtesy as to what about the other person. Right. And here's just another thing. When you go to break up, don't do it over text. <laughs> Don't do it over message. Right. Don't do it over phone call. Right. Treat the person with at least a little bit of dignity because they nice they dated you. Yeah. See what I mean? They went out on a limb and you see what I mean? And you're going to turn and bite the hand that was nice to you? Huh? <laughs> so I mean they gave you a chance. You you don't screw people over when they give you a chance. <laughs> right. With that being said, meet with them face to face and be as nice about it as possible. Uh -huh. Look, and, and, and honestly, this is why I, I highly don't encourage ca just casual dating, is because you need, you should, there should be a reason why you want to break it off. If your reason is something like this, I'm just not attracted to you, then you probably shouldn't have dated them in the first place. See what I mean? What, did they suddenly become uglier after you started dating? <laughs> like, what the heck does that mean? This should be a reason for dating. I mean, for not dating, uh, if, for breaking it off. Um, 
uh, let me see. Um, my my direction in life is different than I see your direction being. For instance, I'm going to I'm going to this country to be a missionary, and you're going into this band to tour the country. We we just don't really have meshing futures mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know, so those are good reasons. But a lot of this stuff should be mauled over before you start dating the person, anyways. Once again, things that aren't really taught nowadays. Uh-huh. And parents have kind of taken a backseat, too, to the whole talking to their kids about sexuality. Remember this when you guys have kids. Your kids need to know about sexuality. I got into porn when I was nine years old. How old is Colt? Five. Five. That's four more years. Yeah. Okay. You see what I'm getting at here? We need to start being a little bit smarter than the world. Okay. Jesus put it like this. The world uses their wealth smarter than the Christians do. What do you, why do you think Jesus said that? <laughs> so it would mean use what we have in a wise way. Mm-hmm. Okay, so don't date if you are still attached to your last relationship. I cannot emphasize this one enough. This is what you need to do. Give it at least a year and a half after a serious relationship to date again. What? Why so long? Because you're going to take that baggage into the next relationship, A. Mm -hmm. B, you are dooming your your next relationship. You are literally dooming it to fail. Because you have not healed as a person, and then you're going to go into another relationship, not healed, Mm -hmm. and you're going to have a broken marriage. Or, I'm sorry, a broken relationship with this person, even if it doesn't go into a marriage. And in fact, here's the thing, guys. A, a, a breakup should be so graceful that you can still be friends with the person after the fact. Mm-hmm. Because you two should both be adult, acting like adults. And if you can't act like an adult, you shouldn't be dating. Right. How, how old is old enough to date? When you can start acting mature. <clears throat> when you can start acting mature. If you don't know that you're able to, don't. There's no rush. If you think that maybe you're doing dating for the wrong reasons, don't. I mean, it's really easy stuff here, guys. We're, there's no pressure. It's okay to stay single. It's okay to get married. Whatever. Just do it the right way. Act with integrity, whatever you do. Um, so really, don't date if you are still attached to your last relationship. I cannot emphasize this enough. I, I knew one guy who got out of a divorce and instantly tried to date another person. I was like, guy, calm down. You need to chill for a little bit. He's like, I, I knew it was coming. That's okay. I, I understand that you knew your, your divorce was coming. I, I'm sorry that, that that was the way it happened, but, uh, you know, whatever. You still need to give it a break, okay? Because even if you're ready for it, 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 there's just a certain... It's like this. When you have sex with someone, you're bound to that person. Mm-hmm. They, The two become one flesh. And when you divorce, you have, even if you don't feel anything immediately, there just needs to be a time... When you can refocus your attention on God, because a divorce is very draining. Financially, spiritually, go on down the list. It's a draining process. Mm-hmm. Give yourself some time. So, uh, don't date without purpose. Goodness sakes, if you're dating someone, there should be a purpose behind the thing that you're doing. Okay? See, it seems how, look, when you're dating, think about this. This might be the person who I spend the rest of my life with. Get past the motions of it, though, because what we try to do is. I'm going to wake up with this person beside me. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be so great. And the truth is marriage isn't like that. Marriages has up, marriages have ups and downs. That's just the way that they work. They can work if, if you work at it, but, I mean, you know what I mean? It's work either way. And uh, so don't date without purpose. And don't date a friend's ex. This is stuff that I threw in here because we're talking about dating protocol. I know this doesn't sound like, well, that's not from the Bible. This is common sense, guys. Don't right. date somebody that's going to cause a rift with you and your friends, yeah. with you and the person, with you and your family. Be wise when you're dating. You know what I mean? Like, goodness sakes, you don't have to throw your whole life away because we're in love. Love – I don't want to sound fatalistic here, guys, but love fades. It does. Eventually, five years after marriage, ten years after marriage, fifteen years after marriage, you're going to wake up and you're going to realize that – you're spending your life with a person, not an object that you fantasize over. It's, it's a person. Mm-hmm. Sex becomes boring sometimes. Uh, sometimes you get tired of those same stupid questions over and over again. Sometimes you get tired of having to live a certain way just to make them happy. You know what I mean? Little irritating things like that because it's a marriage. It's not like things are roses all the time. 
See what I mean? So don't throw away your whole life, everything you've worked so hard for, just because you have feelings for somebody. See what I mean? And also, I do want to say this, like I've said it a thousand times, I'm sure it's probably somewhere else in here, there's a lot more to a relationship than looks. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said? We reach our prime when we hit it about 16 or 17, we start looking good. The zits start going away, the face starts maturing, we start getting our adult face. We don't look like a kid anymore. But that adult face slowly starts to look wrinkled about 28, 30, and then by about 40, good lord, we look old. And then we hit 50, and it's like, good God, this was only 30 years after 20. You see what I mean? Our looks don't last that long. We have to, I'm sorry, Zach. We have to come, we have to, come to grips with that, you know what I mean? You see all these people in high school who say, I was, I was a star of football, I was Mr. Good Looking, and well, enjoy it while it lasts, because you're not going to be in high school more than four years. You see, it's just not going to last that long. <laughs> so don't pick somebody because they're attractive. And definitely, definitely, definitely never cheat because someone is attractive. Now, let me just throw this out. Spoiler alert. You're going to find someone more attractive than your spouse. It's going to happen. You're not with your spouse because you're attractive. They're, they're the most attractive person in the world. You're with them because you love them. Mm -hmm. And love goes beyond feelings. See what I mean? Think about this. Let's say, roll with me on down hypothetical lane. You marry, I mean, Mr. Perfect, or, or Mrs. Perfect, uh, you know, and whatever. She's just the best thing, or he's just the best thing, whatever. And uh, then you have a house fire. You guys barely make it out, and you find out the person's horribly horribly disfigured. And they look like, I don't even know what you would say, a fold of fat that's been put on the put on a frying pan and then mashed with a oh. piece of, I don't know. Just go down the list. They look, they look gross. Would you still stay married to them? If you can say yes, yes, then you're ready to marry this person. See what I mean? Yeah. But if the answer is, well, I don't know. See what I mean? You don't marry someone for looks. You don't marry someone for money. You don't marry someone for all that nonsense. No. Now, there is something called a prearranged marriage where, you're, where your parents pick, in which case your only job is to really just uh, make it work. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> you don't have to find the other person attractive. You just have to have to love them and serve them as your spouse. That's your job. Okay, but if you do have a choice and you're in your spouse, like you probably will in America, don't pick somebody based off of money and don't pick somebody based off of looks and don't waste your time with that nonsense. It's a very small fraction of a relationship. Never date someone from church. Good God, never date someone from church. Can you spell church split? Don't do it. What? Uh, yeah. Oh, right. Uh, Good example. Uh, well, you guys got married, so well, yeah. that doesn't really. I, I more meant like because then when you when you don't get married, you know, it kind of causes rocks. But I mean that that's true too. Let's say you you go to a church your whole life, you date someone. And I actually forgot that you and Becky met. At, yes. I totally forgot that. Anyways, you know, and then like let's say a situation happens where there, where there's divorce. It ca does cause a lot of just awkwardness. Mm. You know what I mean? Just awkwardness. Awkwardness. And, you know. Just, yeah. And I've seen this happen multiple times. Uh, I, I actually completely forgot about that. Uh, Sorry, Zach. I didn't mean to uh, cause you any... Uh, uh, really, like... <coughs> well, anyways. I kind of have an example about that as well. Which one? About the last one. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Because the guy that I ended up dating, I went to school with him and I grew up in a Christian school. Uh huh. Oh, how'd that go for you, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> it lasted two and a half years. But it didn't end on good terms because his family is more traditional. Ah. Mine's not. So ah. Kinda. Uh -huh. uh, kinda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not a good idea. And <laughs> the thing with the uh, don't date while you're married and or separated. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm seeing. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Say no more, Zach. I, I'm, I'm already, uh, you know. <laughs> you know, dating is a very tricky thing. And the thing about dating, everybody you date is going to view dating a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You're going to go on a first date with one person. They're going to be like, so, I want to eventually have kids. And you're going to be like, oh, holy crap, we're on the first date. Wind back the gears. <laughs> then you're going to meet other people who are dating like three, four years and like, you want to get married? So, I mean, yeah. I think... It's probably healthiest at the beginning of the date that you, you just kind of get it out there. Right. What are you wanting from this date? 
See what I mean? And here's another thing that we're going to talk about this with the love commitment triangle. Don't unload all your garbage on the person. At one shot. Yeah. They should know you. Okay? Right. And if there's things you have, secret things yeah. that you have, yeah. gradually yeah. tell them as it becomes important. Don't right. hide it from them, but don't overwhelm them. No. But there should be an equal amount of sharing intimate details Little. as there is commitment. Yeah. There's a love commitment triangle. It's on the sheet if you got one. We're going to break it down. Just hold on for a minute, okay? <laughs> so let's talk about divorce. Especially in the Sims of God, divorce was a big hot topic. Mm. In fact, for a long time, you couldn't be a licensed pastor with the Sims of God if you had been divorced. Mm. Unless you had been divorced before you before you got saved, uh -huh. and then it was still up to the discretion of your district. Uh. This is, So it's only in recent years that they've actually allowed people who have been divorced. Divorce, so. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And even then, you weren't allowed to remarry unless it was very, very, very special uh, special circumstances. So, uh, from coming from the Sims of God, I have quite a bit to say on this. <coughs> so let's first kind of get an idea of what the Bible says about it. And the first place that any discussion of divorce should begin is in Malachi chapter 2. Verse 16. I'll start a little bit early. I'll start in verse 13. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless, faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. The Bible says in Malachi that God hates divorce. That God hates divorce. He literally despises it. So this is something that we should always consider whenever we start a discussion of divorce, when, whichever way you're going to go on this. It is okay. It's not okay. That should always be be the starting point. But we do know from from the law, you know, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, that it, per, divorce was permissible, though. Okay? He had to give her a, a certificate of divorce, but it was permissible. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So <clears throat> basically what's happening is people were kind of just getting divorced for whatever reason. I shouldn't say people, men. And women really had no rights in the society, so they just kind of had to go, around, go away with whatever the man said. And he could really divorce you for any reason whatsoever. And so in order to curb this, Jesus says something that's not a literal statement. It's something called hyperbole, which means it's, let me say it in a, in a simplified way. It's an intentional over-exaggeration. I, I, that's not really the definition of hyperbole, but we'll make it work for tonight, okay? So basically what he's saying is, you guys are getting divorced for everything, but unless it's for sexual immorality, it's, it's adultery. See what I mean? Because what they were doing is they were divorcing and marrying another person. So why were we getting divorced? See what I mean? They weren't getting the grasp of divorce. And that's why the verse before says it was also said whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Um, but anyways, and then he talks about oaths after that. But uh, then if you hop down to chapter 19, verse 6, uh, he says this. <coughs> Mm -hmm. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then in verse 8, he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Because of your hardness of heart. Basically what Jesus is saying is this. You've been mistreating your wives, and God allowed an out for the wife that they can get divorced, and they don't have to put up with your crap. 
See what I mean? You can in Mark he actually doesn't say this. He says um, that he you make the woman an adulterer, but then he says also you woman make your make your husband an adulterer. Why did Mark include this? Because there was this Herodid, um there was this whole relationship thing that was going on. You can read about it. I think in in Mark uh, I forget, but anyways, one of the Herods gets with his brother's. Uh, wife or daughter or something. I forget which. And anyways, it's just this whole tiff about it. So Mark included that in there to kind of say, yes, this was in fact wrong. Um, and then in, uh, it's a whole long thing. I don't really want to get into that. Um, and I say to you, whoever divorces a wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So I will say this. Well, let me wait to say something. First Corinthians chapter seven. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. The first thing I want to say about this is this. A, never divorce if your intention is to get with someone else. Mm -hmm. This should not be the reason for divorce. And when you do this, you are literally causing yourself and the other person to be an adulterer. Because God only allows, not commands, allows a break of the covenant of marriage under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's the first thing that should be said. Obvious reasons for divorce. Now, th this is not, I'm not saying obvious reasons that you can get a divorce. I'm saying obvious reasons that people get a divorce. Okay? People out there get divorces. Obvious reasons that they get divorces. Uh, physical danger to self or children. And it's often said, well, the Bible doesn't say that that's a grounds, a grounds for divorce. Well, yes, but here's the thing. If your children are in physical danger, get them out of there. Right. I'm not saying you have to divorce the person, but your kids don't have to pick up the pieces of your stupid decisions. That's not fair to them. Right. The kid's safety always comes first. Exactly. Always. If there's any situation where the where the ex spouse is, is abusing the children, CYFD is a thing. Mm -hmm. Called CPS on them. Uh, you know what I mean? Like right. this is a thing where I'm not saying you should try and cause problems, but a child's safety has to be our primary concern in every situation. Mm -hmm. That's it's not okay to sit by and God's working on their heart. Well, that's great, right. but God also told us that we need to step up and do social justice. Right. We need to make sure that the, that the widows and the orphans are taken care of. And it's not okay to allow a child to be abused no. while you sit there twiddling your thumbs because God has bigger plans. Yeah, it's called you. He sent you. You go take care of it. Right. Well, what's so hard to understand with this? Now, as far as danger to self, I have seen people quietly endure physical assault. And I'm not condoning it or or uh, criticizing it, whatever, as long as your consciousness is as happy. But I would strongly encourage separation. I'm not saying divorce. I never encourage someone to get a divorce because the Bible says very, very strongly that God hates divorce. And he also says very, very strongly about how significant the bond of, of marriage is. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to tell somebody to get a divorce. That's not my place. However, I would say that maybe making sure that they get the health that they need Maybe they're not all up there or something. I don't know. Um, but I would definitely say, you know, seek a safe environment. Once again, why I strongly, strongly warn people to date people that you know. And watch out for those signs. Because you'd be surprised. Some people that seem like nice people that are actually not nice people. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, um, divorce is allowed but not required. Okay. Always seek reconciliation in your marriage. Always seek reconciliation in your marriage. Um, even after divorce has happened, it is possible for remarriage. You can still you can still save things. I, I've seen I've seen it happen before, and it can happen. Now I'm not saying you should like stalk your ex spouse. That's not what I'm saying at all. For goodness sakes, don't do that. But I am saying that that be in prayer, and God can mend things right. if it's. If it's something that he does, but he doesn't always do that. So you need to be okay with letting your ex go too. Um, so divorce is allowed, not required. Why is that important? Because God doesn't say you have to get a divorce if your spouse cheats on you. He's saying if your spouse cheats on you, it is permissible for you to get a divorce. But keep in mind – well, I'll get to that in a second. 
So God doesn't command the divorce. That's something to notice. Um, the thing about marriage is there will always be something that comes up that threatens to destroy it. There will always be something that comes up. Oh, things are going pretty good. Well, wait another year or two. They won't because that's marriage. Anytime you have a relationship with someone, you're going to have rocks in the road. That's just a way that it happens. You don't have to throw in the towel, oh, it's nothing but disaster. No, I mean, the same thing could be said about being a pastor. All you deal with the, uh, with the pastor is problem after problem. Yeah, you do face a lot of problems as a pastor, but there's a lot of other things that you face that aren't problems. Mm -hmm. There's good and bad times. Right. It rains and it's sunny. So I mean, like there, there, there is differences. It's not always bad. But with that being said, you should always have the attitude of reconciliation mm -hmm. in a marriage. Even if your spouse makes it where it's physically impossible to reconcile, still have the attitude of reconciliation. When you give in and you allow that bitterness to set in, that, that hopelessness, that despair to set in, that's when an attitude takes hold. All marriages have problems. Divorce should never be to get with another. I already said this. I want to emphasize that a hundred times. Did you know that sometimes you'll be married and you'll be attracted to another person? Do you know that sometimes you'll be married and you'll be tempted to, treat, to cheat on your spouse? Do you know those things happen? Mm -hmm. It does. Divorce should never be to get with another person. That's not why you divorce somebody. Right. Okay? Let me give you an example of a justified divorce, not something that I would say get a divorce, but a justified divorce. Gracie is continually cheating on me, and I know it. And I say, Gracie, stop cheating on me. And she says no, and she keeps cheating on me. That would be an okay grounds for divorce. I would not say get a divorce because I do not think I have that right. But once again, that is what he's talking about, okay? Let me show you a less acceptable reason for divorce. Gracie cheats on me once because she put herself in a compromising position and it was a mistake. And, you know, see what I mean? She never did it again. And so that's that. Well, I find out, oh, I'm divorced. Well, you can. You're justified. Okay? God allows it. However, your marriage could grow into something that it, that it could never have been if you just allow that maturity to set in. See what I mean? Forgive them for that stupid thing that they did. See what I mean? And, and there'll be a level of growth that comes that, well, yeah. There's a lot more I could say, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and stop it there. Um, remarriage is sometimes okay depending on the circumstance. If you're remarrying because you got a divorce, bad idea. If you are remarrying because you feel lonely because you have had a divorce, bad idea. If you are remarrying because, see what I mean, remarry because of this. God's bought by, brought somebody by, and you think that you could better their life, and that you could, um, your ministry would grow grow from this, and that it, it, you know what I mean. It's a godly thing to do. See what I mean? That, there's a, there's a good thing. So re remarriage can be okay. It's not like remarriage in itself is bad. Heartless remarriage is bad. So. Um, if you're in a if you're in a marriage, take it seriously. But there are some times that marriages end, and there's nothing you can do about it. I have a friend who uh, his wife just one day left, and no warning, no anything. She's just, just gone, and uh, he you know walked in. He's like, where'd she go? She just never came back. I mean, he didn't tell him or anything. He just she just left. And uh, then you know she fought him for custody of the kids, and he's just like, man, what the heck's going on? See what I mean? <laughs> so now. He's divorced from from his wife. He goes through daily depression. He doesn't even, even after he found out the why of it, he's like, well, we could have just fit, worked on it. You could have told me. See what I mean? But instead, they're just dead. And they, they'd been married for like four or six years or something like that. And they had uh, three or four kids. I mean, just really traumatic. And he, he loves his kids. I mean, he, he's one of the best dads that I have seen <laughs> of, this, of my generation. He's just a great dad. Um, I mean... He's a, obviously people always have their faults, but I mean right. he, he loves his kids. See what I mean? And it's just terrible. I, what do you say in a situation like that? I, I don't know, man. Yeah. You got me. <laughs> there, as much as as we like to say, oh, the Bible says this, and it's black and white. Therefore, no, the world really doesn't work in black and white. It works in gray. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you have to navigate every single situation you're put into in life. And you don't know how to prepare for it. Right. 
that's just the way life happens. You'll never know how to prepare for it. You just have to do the best you can with what you got. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, it doesn't make sense when parents say, oh, my parents really messed up as parenting me. They, they did this, they did that. They they did the best they could. <laughs> they, they bluffed their way. They, it's the first time they've ever done it. They bluffed their way through it. <laughs> and hey, some things worked and some things didn't. Then there's some parents who genuinely just didn't give a crap and didn't, you know, didn't try. They didn't love their kids. And I'm not saying anything about that. You know, that's a terrible situation. Right. But when you have sex, you have to realize that there's always a possibility that you could get the person pregnant. The only possibility is if you don't have sex. I've seen people who are physically not able to have children who got pregnant. I don't know how it worked. I don't know. It wasn't supposed to happen. It happened. I don't know. It's not really something you can plan for, but you know you have to always realize that there's a chance that that kid could come into the equation. Yeah. And abortion doesn't resolve a problem. First off, a baby isn't a problem; it's a blessing. But second off, even if it if it messes with your life, you're not resolving the problem. You're no. killing your child. Right. You're not undoing a mistake. You're you're killing your child. So you couldn't deal with it, and you didn't want them to be in the foster care system, whatever. So you killed them. Yeah. No, I, I, I prevented them from being born. You killed them. Uh -huh. Well, a lot of kids uh, are, are miscarried, and a lot of people have miscarriages anyways. That's great. That's a natural process of the body. That, that's a tragic thing, but it happens. Uh -huh. That didn't happen. You killed somebody. Right. And you actually blamed it on your own selfish motives. That doesn't make you a better person. That makes you a worse person. Yeah. But I wouldn't have been able to provide for them. Guess what? There's a waiting list for babies to be adopted. There is. Uh -huh. Or... You can randomly leave a baby in some place that, that you know it'll be safe, and somebody will take it. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? There's, like, for instance, right? Like you can you can leave it at a police department or something like that, and like they'll find it a, a place to stay. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, it's not like oh, if, if they'll be stuck in the foster system forever. The kids that are stuck in the foster foster system are kids that are like six and up. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not the kids. They're, they're not the little guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, pretty much after about two or three is when the when your chances of getting adopted go down drastically. And then by about eight, there's a really small chance that you're adopted. And then by teens, there's such a small chance that you're going to get adopted. And here's the thing. People keep, oh, I want kids. And so they whine and cry because they're not physically able to have kids. When they could adopt someone right. who's whining and crying because they don't have parents. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? See, I mean, we need to act with integrity as Christians. We need to face our culture and adapt to it. So, what about affairs? First off, I just want to say this: I do not condone, condone affairs. Affairs are sinful, and there's no, there's no, there's no justification for an affair. If your spouse doesn't have sex with you, I'm sorry. You need to resolve that issue, and you need to, you need to work towards healing in that, in that marriage. There's probably a reason why your spouse is not having sex with you. Or masturbate, but do not have an affair. See, so, I mean, we talked about this last week. Affairs and masturbation is not inherently evil. The lust is inherently evil. Okay, remember that. Um, so, anyways, uh, affair, having an affair is unfaithfulness. It is not only physical. If you are looking at porn, you are having an affair on your, on your spouse. If you are thinking about someone, you are having an affair on your spouse. Those are all having an affair. So, um, second off, uh, it is very harmful if you are doing it. Stop. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not even going to bother looking up Bible passages because, I mean, this is kind of an obvious one. Um, looks play a very small role if you're having an affair because you think someone is attractive. That's not going to last. See what I mean? You should instead be looking at the person who married you, regard, knowing, all, knowing your faults has married you and is by your side. You should focus on them instead. Um, sin thrives in secrecy. Admit it to your spouse. What? But wouldn't it be healthier if no? Let me tell you a story. There's this woman who, when she was 16, 16, okay, had sex with this man she was not married to. She went on to be a missionary, and she um, she uh, started you know, in her 60s or 70s. I, I think it's in her 70s. She started having all kinds of different mental mental problems, uh, depression. She dealt with all of her life. Her health was degrading, all kinds of different things. And uh, somebody asked her, well, when did this all start? She said, when I was 16, I had sex with, sex with a guy I wasn't married to. It's been, it's haunted me ever since. Once she admitted it, all her illnesses started going away. Her health was, was revived. She said, I don't even remember what it felt like to be depressed. 
because it sticks with you. Yeah. We think that the that the way to healing our marriage is not telling our spouse, but the truth is, no. Tell your spouse. Had you told your spouse in the first place, it probably wouldn't have ever happened. I told you guys last week what I did, had to do with would do with Gracie. I said, Gracie, look, I find this woman extremely attractive. I cannot stop thinking about her. We need to just stop going to this part of town. And so we stopped going to that part of town. And guess what? Eventually the feeling subsided. Guess what? Eventually I stopped thinking about her. And guess what? Our marriage wasn't harmed by it because I went and told my wife. Now, let's roll this back another way. I don't tell Gracie. Then eventually your feelings are going to get the better of you. You're going to drive yourself to go see that person because you just can't stand to be apart. Right? It's called infatuation. And then you're going to do something like romantic gestures, uh, dating them, giving them roses. I mean, go down the list. And then eventually it, it goes into a relationship and you're having an affair. See? Because things escalate. That's how they work. So with that being said, sin thrives in secrecy. Admit it to your spouse. Where, however far you've gone down, your marriage is still salvageable. But give your spouse time to cool off, though. After you've told them, give it time. Don't just say, hey, I cheated on you. Want to go have sex? <laughs> See what I mean? You have to give them time. Yeah. And say it in a way that they can receive. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for instance, you've been fighting for the past week. Yeah? Well, I've been cheating on you. Not a good way to let them know. No. <laughs> In fact, maybe wait and resolve the issue that you're having with them and then say, look, this happened. I'm sorry. I don't want to end what we have because of my stupidity. Please forgive me for this and just give them time. Mm -hmm. Give them time. Well, the problem is, is our pride gets the better of us. And what's pride? Putting ourselves first. Uh -huh. Instead of putting God first. And what happens when we do that? We only care for our own well-being. We don't care for our spouse's well-being. See what I mean? So. Okay. So give it time. Forgive your spouse for their failures. If you have been cheated on and you are not married, you were talking about someone you're dating, you should definitely not marry this person, even if they apologize. Why? Because if someone is unable to physically control themselves in the bonds of dating, they're not going to do it in marriage. That's just a fact of life, which is why I say very strongly, do not have sex before marriage. Because not only will it ruin your relationship and drive a wedge between you and your partner, but eventually it'll come back to bite you. It will. Even if you marry the person you had premarital sex with, it'll still come back to bite you. Um, they'll be um, they'll question the things that you do. They'll be insecure in the relationship. You'll be insecure in the relationship. Uh, you'll be you'll look for uh, gratification over relationship. Uh, intimacy won't be as deep for you. You'll you'll always be looking over your shoulder. Always feel like you have something to hide, even when you don't. I mean, I could go down the list, but I think that this kind of just summarizes it. Bad things happen. Better just not do it. And if you have had sex with someone that you're not married to, I would highly encourage breaking it off. What? The very fact that you're having premarital sex shows that your spirit is not where it needs to be with God. And if it's not where it needs to be with God, you're not going to be the spouse that that person needs. And if they're willing to give it up for you, that means they treasure you more than the relationship with God, which means they're probably not the kind of spiritual person that you need either. See what I mean? And all these different things with insecurities, are going to all, they're all going to come back and bite you in the butt. So it's better to just break it off. But if you just can't imagine doing this, if, if you know, whatever, um, then I would say rush the marriage. Or stop having sex. But but resolve the issue. Don't just keep doing the same thing you're doing. You're going to get the same results. So, I mean, it's, not, it's always going to be bad because this, people don't understand this. Sin never produces good. So if I'm having sex outside of marriage and I really love this person, will it produce good? No. If I'm having sex with this person and I end up marrying them, will it produce good? No. If I'm having sex inside of marriage, will it produce good? Yes. You mean it's that easy? Yes. It's that easy. Now, going back to the, what I was saying originally, if, you're, if your partner is cheating on you and you're not even married yet, maybe they're not as into you as you are them. And if that's a thing, that's going to set a precedence for your entire relationship. Sometimes people get married just because they're desperate. Well, I'm just going to mess up again with somebody else. Might as well marry this person I had sex with. Well, I'm lonely anyways. I'll never find another partner. Might as well marry this person. And those are not good reasons to marry. 
So divorce won't resolve the hurt, and you'll be worse off. Don't, people think that with divorce comes the end of heartache. Nope. Nope. You're financially depleted. You're emotionally depleted. Divorce doesn't solve the issue. It doesn't at all. All that it does is separates the issue. That's all it does. So a divorce won't resolve the hurt that you've experienced through an affair. They've cheated on me. I'm going to get them back with divorce. You're getting yourself back. Mm -hmm. It's not going to resolve the issue. Because you have been hurt, and rather than growing from it, you are reacting to it. And we talked about this last week. What happens when we react to it? We cause more problems. See what I mean? So, and you'll be worse off. You'll, you'll, then you'll try to go and get into another relationship. But here's the thing, though, guys. You won't be able to, to be beneficial in another relationship because you're still in the last relationship. Oh, I'm over him. No, you're not. No, you're not. So, this is kind of how it goes. There's hurt people. And there's temporary fixes. This is sleeping around. This is getting in another relationship. This is all those other things. And then there's true healing. True healing can only be found in finding a quiet and still, still place with the Father. As we seek after God, he brings us to a place of healing that is not found in any of the temporary fixes. Not found in sex. It's not found in all those other things. The only exception to this is when there's a, a, a space between you and your spouse. Sex is a wonderful way to cure, the, to cure the, the issues with you and your spouse. You'd be surprised in the confines of marriage. People are having arguments and whatnot. Sex is a great way to, I don't know, it's just a certain level of intimacy that, that you really have to forgive someone when they're real close to you like that. Hard to be mad at someone when they're all up in your stuff. Okay? <laughs> just throwing that out there. Proverbs 14, 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And I think this definitely applies to, to both affairs and divorce. Both of those things can seem like good ideas at the time, in the heat of the moment. But they lead to death. Divorce leads to death emotionally. It leads to death of relationship. It leads, it leads to death in what you and your kids have. Because divorce will always destroy kids. Mm -hmm. Even if it's done in the most tactful and nice ways. Because kids need to see structure. Mm -hmm. They need to see love. They need to see compassion. And what's hard is when a divorce is brought on and you didn't want it to happen. And your spouse leaves you anyways. That's hard. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, how do you counsel someone when that happens to them? You can't. Unless you've personally gone through it. In which case, even then, it's hard because each, each circumstance is different. So I would say, just because someone's divorced doesn't mean that, that they necessarily did something bad. And also, even if they did do something bad, people who have gone through divorces have been hurt. They need acceptance and love, not rejection and looking down on them. It's not going to resolve the issue. Uh, just the same as when you meet a transsexual person telling them, well, you're that stupid. You just got a mental disorder. That's not going to resolve the issue. So... Um, some more details just going through this. You will have things go through your mind. Don't dwell. Things will always go through your mind. It's called temptation. Don't let them dwell. Let them move right on. You just tell them this. There ain't room enough for you in these here parts. Move along. In marriage, spicing up sex is not bad. I, there was actually a teaching that was going around in the church that there were sinful sex positions. In other words, there is the missionary position, which is the one where the woman's on the bottom with the guy on top. Just real simple. It's the one everybody has ever had sex in. The majority of the population has sex in that position. It's called the uh, missionary position. And for, for a while, people thought that this was God's position. And all the other positions were just sinful. You did anything else, sinful. There's nothing wrong with spicing up your sex. And I know I talked against uh, S&M, you know, sadism, masochism, the bondage sex. I talked about against that. But that doesn't mean that you can't have kinky sex. So, I mean, and you have to find something that your spouse is okay with that's okay and doesn't harm them and doesn't cause you to lust after someone else. And you see what I mean? You just have to kind of get a feel for it. I don't want to, I'm not trying to sound dirty. I don't mean to feel like that. But you just kind of have to get a vibe for your partner and you just kind of have to get a vibe for sex and kind of – until you're sure of what you believe on it, don't do it. And then when you are sure about what you believe on it, roll with what your spouse has. You know what I mean? Be kind of willing to budge on that kind of stuff. So, um, pray for others. Anyone can fall. There is no one on the planet that cannot fall. Even, even pastors can fall, you guys. Be in prayer for people. 
Uh, don't take dates to movies. I just wanted to throw this in there. If you're wanting somebody on a date, a movie is a good way to have no conversation. Take dates somewhere like a movie. I mean, I'm sorry. Take dates somewhere like a restaurant. Sorry, a slip of the tongue. Uh, what Gracie and I used to do is we used to go take uh, uh, meals to the park and eat at the park. And, you know, go on walks and stuff like that. It's a nice way to spend time with somebody and it's recreational too. So you get fresh air and you get clear head. And you see what I mean? It's, it's funner. So um, beware of touching or kissing. Touching and kissing is not necessarily bad. I would say very, very strongly. Foster says in his book, that the only thing that is reserved for marriage is the actual genital penetration. I don't really agree with him. Um, because, and he says this, I'm trying not to be legalistic. And I understand that. And, he, and so he says, you know, I highly discourage people from the breasts and the genitalia. And I understand what he's trying to say, you know, but here's the thing. Things always, things get heated and they always progress to the next level. So I would say... Keep even kissing down to a minimum while you're dating. I mean, and only in public. I wouldn't. I wouldn't kiss in in in, in privacy. I, I wouldn't do it. And I know people say, "Well, what about PDA?" Don't be obnoxious with, with your with your affection towards somebody. Obviously, I'm not saying that at all. But uh, with that being said, it's better to be a little bit obnoxious than to fall to sin. And you know, so if you just really want to kiss them or whatever, do it in public. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the touching, my general rule is try and keep your hands to yourself as best as you can. Uh, when you start rubbing and, you know, things get hot and heavy, it's very easy to just lose control. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention is I mentioned uh, things like masturbation whatnot last week. I, I knew we had this professor in college who told this story of this guy who had to, um, he was a salesman, door to door salesman, and he would masturbate before every every door because he just got so um, um, nervous and, and he was in, in the war, and that's how he relieved stress when he was uh, in, in the war. He dealt with PTSD and he, he really never got over it and wasn't given the proper treatment. And so his process was to masturbate before every single door. You see where this is a problem. Not only is the PTS not being dealt with, but obsessive masturbation, that's something that, that usually shows that something's wrong. I said that masturbation is okay as long as there's no lust with it. And I would also say this it shouldn't be obsessive. It shouldn't be obsessive masturbation. That's the same as getting drunk. That's the same as, you know, see what I mean? Balance. Mm -hmm. If you're ma masturbating like once every couple of days, that's, I don't really think that's a big deal. Uh, a couple times every couple of hours, that's a, that's a bad that's a bad thing. Yeah. But anyways, um, I'm trying not to make things too complicated here. I'm trying to keep things simple, but I'm also trying to answer questions that people actually have. So <clears throat> this is called the marriage. Uh, I mean, sorry, the love uh, the love marriage. Um, the, the love commitment triangle. Jeez. Uh, and how you have it is at the bottom is love. You fall in love with somebody, right? Right. This may be, oh, I have feelings for them, which hopefully that's only the starting route for that. Okay. You should find them attractive, but attraction isn't the number one thing. You should have feelings for them, but feelings aren't the number one thing. Love is, is, is a commitment and, and a serve to someone, you know what I mean? That, and so they should probably be someone who you think is worthy of that, who you think is going to be a good partner or a good father or what if, mother or whatever. Um, and so then as, as the marriage grows, what people try to do is they try to get more commitment by throwing in more intimacy. But think of it as two sides of a triangle. Here's love, and you're trying to increase your love, but that's not equal with the commitment. So you try to get them into more commitment by having more sex with them, telling them more intimate details about all your personal life. Well, all of a sudden, it's not a triangle, guys. It's it's a line down here and a line up here, and the two aren't connecting. Right. We need to go. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys think Sesame Street, whatever. Yeah. Um, what what needs to happen is as the marriage develops, here's your love. Okay. As your love it develops, your intimacy, commitment needs to develop, and this climaxes with marriage. And sex. See? Because remember, when sex is outside of the confines of marriage, it's a life-affirming process without the intent of unifying. Mm -hmm. See? So, uh, people change. 
we're going to get married one day, so it's okay to have sex. Well, okay, let, let me break this down for you. First off, people change. Also, you find out people aren't who you thought you, heard the, who you thought they were. Gracie, have you at least two or three different times in our marriage thought this wasn't the person I married? <laughs> at least two or three times. And we dated, and then we had an engagement, and then we married. See what I mean? So there's always going to be things about that person you don't know about. I know them completely. False. False. It is impossible to know somebody completely like that unless you have been married for 20 years. It's just not going to happen. Right. So, um, people do change. Um, things get blurred in life. You start losing your direction in life, your purpose in life. Things just get, have a way of getting blurred. Um, it's still sin regardless of whether you're gonna get, you plan on getting married one day or not. And marriage is a public declaration. It's basically a commitment saying, hey, God, hey, you, hey, me. I'm staying faithful to this person, and this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And I'm not going to let anything come in between, be it money, be it um, you know, another person, be it anything. This, These two people are going to be one person. So it's a public declaration. Marriage carries God's covering and protection. Marriage is the only form that carries this protection from God, where we're able to do things that are otherwise not allowed, like sex. See what I mean? It carries special bonds to it. Um, if two people, if you have sex with this person over here, then you have sex with this person over there, that's sin. But let's say you have sex with this person who you're not married to, and then you confess to your spouse and you go have sex with them, all of a sudden that wrong thing is now right. Why? Because it has God's protection to it. I think that this is, is one of the reasons why why uh, homosexual uh, homosexuals desire marriage is because they desire that idea that it's okay. They desire that idea that um, they can receive that same connection because they feel loneliness. They they have the attraction to the same sex and they're trying to be happy and they're thinking wrong that things are going to bring happiness. But what did we just talk about at the beginning of this lesson? Things don't bring happiness. Mm -hmm. Marriages do not bring happiness. Staying single does not bring happiness. These things do not bring happiness. Happiness is found in seeking after God. So it's a pointless pursuit to get married for the for the purpose of happiness. It's not going to happen. So, Or it might for you know two years, and then you'll hit the third year, and you'll say, I want a divorce because it's not all cracked up to be. Well, marriage isn't about what it cracked up to be. It's about staying faithful to someone. So, um, so on your on your sheet, if you have the sheet, Gracie, um, what you would do is you draw a triangle, or the triangle's on your, already on your sheet. On the top is marriage and sex, and on the bottom you put love. On one side you put commitment. I'll wait for you to put that in. And on the other side you put um, uh, affection or intimacy or love, whatever words you think fits best. And the idea is that commitment has to grow with the with the with the with the intimacy. Intimacy has to grow with commitment. What people try to do is, I've been dating this guy for a person for for so long, and I really feel like things are are going off. So, I'm just going to tell him everything. You went to here, and he wasn't commitment wise. He wasn't there. That's why it, why it didn't work. You rushed it. Love grows with the commitment, and that's why you both need to be clear about it. How committed? How committed are you? Are, is this somewhere that you actually see this going somewhere, or or am I reading too much into this? Because I'd like to know before I dedicate my whole life to you. And it turns out that you're just casually dating. See what I mean? Like this is something that needs to be established, and it's okay. I just want to know where we stand before I waste my whole life waiting for you to propose. And you're not going to do it. See what I mean? So, um, <clears throat> intimacy and commitment must grow together. Otherwise, it's shaky. And I will say this: we're going to talk about this later. It causes a rift in your marriage before you ever get married. Okay? It always does. Because the spiritual foundation is not there. It's all based on a physical um, uh, thing, which anything based off the physical is not going to last because the physical is always changing. Mm -hmm. You don't look the same now as you did t 10 years ago. Okay. You won't look the same as you will in another 10 years. Our physical world is always changing. When I was a kid, the, uh, America looked like the best place in the world and it looked like they had no problems. Now I'm an adult, I'm like, holy crap, there's problems everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. It's all, if I move to China, I'm going to face problems there. If I move to Ireland, I'm going to face problems there. There's nowhere in the world I'm not going to face problems. You just start realizing, oh, well, that's different. 
<coughs> so technically, touching isn't really sex. But it's better to avoid since it will start the binding and cause temptation. It is nice sharing a certain level of intimacy that you can say to your spouse. I haven't shared this with anyone else. It just brings a whole new level of intimacy. You know what I mean? Um, I always wanted to have been able to, to told my wife that I had never seen a woman naked before. But thanks to pornography and me giving into it for so long, I had seen a naked woman before. See what I mean? And so then we had to go through this crap, crap about dealing with it. You know, it was just unnecessary baggage brought into the marriage. It wasn't necessary. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't something that needed to be there. Here's the thing about mar marriage, too. Marriage, by all accounts, shouldn't work. It has so many things stacked against it, it's just a matter of time before it ends in divorce. But you can make it work if you try hard enough. And all you really have to do is fight hard enough against the forces that are crashing down against it. And it's easier if you don't start, start stacking your own things against it, like pornography, like a history of sex with other people, like kids outside of marriage, like financial despair. It's easier if you don't bring those things into the marriage because there's already enough stuff counting in the marriage against it for it to fail. So, um, But anyways, so finally, if we are a Christian, we have been purchased by God and cannot choose to live our own way. Some may, not stay, some may stay single, some may be married, but all must fight lust. Whether it's lust for attention or lust for sex, lust for power or lust for money, whatever it is, Whatever your station in life, regardless of whether you choose to stay married or stay single, fighting less is something that everybody's going to have to struggle with. That's just a fact of life. And the thing is, if you know the seven deadly sins, you know that my definition of greed, lust, and pride has differed substantially from the traditional definition of these things. And I did that for a reason. Because in the seven deadly sins, you see a lot of overlap. And in the seven deadly sins, it emphasizes the thing more than the heart behind the thing. And I'm trying to emphasize the heart behind the seven deadly sins, which is these three roots, greed, lust, and pride. And as these things get a hold, they kind of have, like, okay, here's one of the seven deadly sins, gluttony. Gluttony could be lust or greed, depending on what the underlying heart, heart condition is. Mm -hmm. See? See what I'm saying? So... Whether it's less for attention or less for sex, less for power, less for money. First John 1 John 1.6 puts it like this. And we're, I'm going to read through till chapter 2, verse 4. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But I thought in Christ we're free from the law. Yes, we're free from, from this law. That doesn't mean we, we are to live as lawless. That means we live by a better law, the law of love. See what I mean? And just because something was wrong and was condemned in the law doesn't mean it's no longer wrong just because we're free from the law. I can marry my sister now. No, no, you can't. See what I mean? <laughs> Being free from the law doesn't mean I'm now lawless. In fact, all the more we should be driven to more morality. The law doesn't say anything about, for instance, uh, um, having sex with minors. See what I mean? It doesn't have it say anything about uh, about stuff like that. Not once does it mention that. It doesn't talk about an age of consent or anything. But now in this new age, the Holy Spirit enlightens us and, and he brings us to, to a greater depth. Of, you know what I mean? And we're able to say, you know what? Some things happened in the past and we can just move on from it. You know what I mean, it doesn't bind us. It doesn't have to be who we are now. We can grow and we can change from it. So verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, if we say we have no sin, the truth isn't even in us. Oh, I, I, I don't sin. You're not even saved. Because anybody who's truly saved knows in, the, knows in their heart that they have sin. See what I mean? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, because he said that we have sinned. <laughs> so chapter 2, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Um, 
I don't know if this should be translated as righteous one because I don't know how this word is is functioning. I have to look at the Greek sentence. But anyways, it, it carries the same idea anyways. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ourselves, or atonement is, is another word you could say. Um, he is atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. See that? If you say, I, you know, I'm serving God, but you're not actually serving God, you're a liar. So I think that this kind of is a great way to summarize this. And to really say this, we need to always be on guard, and we need to always be checking our hearts. And we need to be real with ourselves. And if we've allowed something in, we need to be honest with ourselves and with God, and we need to make sure that that gets back out. You know what I mean? So, any questions? Nope. Nicole? Okay, I'm going to stop there.